Okay. Hello. I think we have everybody back. Welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Starcheski, and I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program. As part of that role, one of my great privileges is from time to time organizing our public programming series. And this year, this spring, we're playing around with the idea of a book club. And we're trying that because we, you know, we want to have events where learning is social, where it's dialogic, where people are making relationships just like they do in an oral history encounter. So uh, as we do in our end of year exhibits, we're kind of playing around with creating events and curated oral histories that try to replicate or pay homage to some of the things we love about oral history. So in this book club, as you know, and this is our last book club event in the series, uh, we're reading oral history novels. So we've read uh, novels that take the form of a fictional oral history, novels about the practice of doing oral history and documentary work. And uh, this I think is maybe the most obvious category. The first thing that would come to mind when you think about an oral history novel is a novel that uses oral history as primary source material. So I'm absolutely thrilled to get to hear the backstory of this book because I've been very curious ever since I, I first read it. Uh, so each of our events features one or more oral historians in conversation with the author. And this week, I'm honored to introduce Obden Mondesir, who's going to be our interlocutor. He's the Associate Director of the Barnard Archives and Special Collections. Previous to that, as the Oral History Manager at the Weeksville Heritage Center, he led oral history projects, including Meals as Collective Memory and the Black Joy Project. As Outreach Archivist at Queens College, he managed the oral history component of the SEEK Documentation Project, that's S-E-E-K, uh, that collected interviews from staff and alumni about the SEEK Rebellion, where faculty and students demanded self-determination and representation within the spirit of third, third worldism. Uh, Obden was a 2015 fellow for the Queen's Memory Project and 2017 West African Research Center fellow. So I think it's clear why I asked him to be in conversation with Caitlin today. So I'll, with that, hand it over to him. Uh, please join me in welcoming Obden and he's gonna kick us off and introduce Caitlin. Cool. Um, Amy, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I would like to thank you and Oma for putting this event together. And um, also like to thank Caitlin for agreeing to be in conversation um, um, tonight. And uh, the first thing I would like to do is uh, provide a land acknowledgement before we start. And um, I, so I will take this time now to acknowledge that we are today streaming from the territories of Lenape, Lenape um, space, or at least I am. And I acknowledge that as scholars, professionals, and inhabitants, we benefit from the continued dispossession of indigenous lands and peoples. I would also like to acknowledge the braided histories of slaves and freed slaves who were forcibly stolen and brought to these lands and the intertwining of those histories with the stories of immigrants who work in the kitchens, the houses, and the fields. Um, uh, also at this moment, I would like to take out some time to uplift the works that I got to review in preparation for this conversation. Um, for those interested in public history and historic houses that tell the stories of non-elite communities, relevant to the contemporary spaces that they're a part of, like Weeksville, um, I am putting in the chat um, a link to this article, uh, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century at a Post-Emancipation Site. Um, it's from May 2015's The Public Historian um, and was written by Jen Scott, who was a former co-director of the Weeksville Heritage Center. And um, the second work that I would like to uplift is one of the more recent manuscripts uh, or monographs about Weeksville, um, it, which is Brooklyn's Promised Land, uh, the Free Black Community of Weeksville, which was written by Judith Wellman. Um, uh, a quick synopsis of this work is uh, Weeksville was founded by African-American entrepreneurs after slavery ended in New York 
state in 1827. Located in East Brooklyn, Weeksville provided a space of physical safety, economic prosperity, education, and even political power. Um, and uh, drawing on maps, newspapers, census records, photographs, and the material culture of buildings and artifacts, Wellman reconstructs the social history and national significance of this extraordinary place. So through the lens of this local community, Brooklyn's Promised Land highlights themes still relevant to African-Americans across the country. Uh, and I am putting the link in there too. And then um, bef before we start and before I introduce um, Caitlin, I wanted to share two quotes to kind of provide us a setting or um, put us in a place to have this conversation. And uh, the first quote that I would like to start with is from Toni Morrison, who is not an oral historian, but I feel is someone that works in the same tradition as Caitlin as a memory worker and someone that also works with narrative. Um, and uh, I'll start with the quote, which is, uh, you are your own stories and therefore free to imagine and experience what it means to be human without wealth, uh, what it feels like to be human without domination over others, uh, without reckless arrogance, without fear of others unlike you, without rotating, rehearsing, reinventing the hatreds you learned in the sandbox. And although you don't have complete control over the narrative, no author does, I can tell you, you can nevertheless create it. Um, and the second quote that I would like to share is from Alessandro Portelli, who is a well-known oral historian and I feel has been discussed at some point, uh, or I know has been discussed at multiple points during the series. And uh, with this quote, I'll read it. Um, the centrality of the individual is enhanced by the fact that oral history is concerned with versions of the past that is with memory. Although memory is always shaped in many ways by the social environment, yet ultimately the act and art of remembering is always deeply personal. Memory may exist in socially structured constructs, but only individuals remember. If we think of it as a process rather than a deposit of data, we can see that like language, memory is social, but only materializes through the minds and mouths of individuals. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to take this moment out to um, introduce uh, Caitlin Greenidge and um, say that Caitlin Greenidge is the author of Liberty, a New York Times critic choice uh, for 2021. Her debut novel was We Love You, Charlie Freeman, published by Algonquin Books and was one of the New York Times critics top 10 books of 2016. Her writing has appeared in Vogue, Glamour, The Wall Street Journal, Elle, Buzzfeed, Transition Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Believer, American Short Fiction, and other places. Uh, she is the recipient of fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Radcliffe Institution for Advanced Study, the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She is currently features director at Harper's Bazaar, as well as a contributing writer for the New York Times. And um, before, last thing I'll do before we get into discussion is read the synopsis for, for Liberty, which is um, Liberty coming, um, Liberty, coming of age, um, as a freeborn Black girl in 1860s Brooklyn, Liberty Sampson was all too aware that her purposeful mother, a practicing physician, had a vision for their future together. Liberty would go to medical, medical school and practice alongside her. But Liberty, drawn more to music than science, feels stifled by her mother's choices and is hungry for something else. Is there really only one way to have an autonomous life? And she is constantly reminded that unlike her mother who can pass, Liberty has skin that is too dark. When a young man from Haiti proposes to Liberty and promises she will be his equal on the island, she accepts, 
only to discover that she is still subordinate to him and all men, as she tries to parse what freedom actually means for a Black woman. Liberty struggles with where she might find it for herself and for generations to come. Um, so um, with that, um, we'd like to welcome you, Caitlin, and um, I don't know, just say hi. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah, and uh, with that, I will start with the first question, uh, which is, uh, as mentioned, Liberty is written from the main character, Liberty Sampson's first person point of view, and in the past tense. The novel opens in 1860s Kings County, New York, and although never really like fully named, um, includes the free Black community of Weeksville. Um, and is part of the setting and the background of the first half of the story. Um, so can you tell us more about Weeksville and how you decided that it would be a part of this novel? Sure, so Weeksville, um, there's sort of two, two parts of, of what Weeksville is. So Weeksville, the historic community was founded in 1838, 11 years after the end of slavery in New York state. And it was founded specifically to um, create a black voting base in the city, um, or sorry, Brooklyn wasn't part of the city then, but in New York state. Um, so basically at that time to vote in New York, you had to own a certain amount of property. And so these group, a, a group of black male entrepreneurs got together, bought up this um, tract of land that was considered um, pretty abandoned and um, unfavorable. And they divided the tracks into the exact amount that you would need to be able to qualify as a voter. And then they advertised in free black newspapers up and down the Eastern seaboard saying, you know, we're building this community, come here. If you are a black person, um, this is, there's this free space here, we will sell land to you um, and you'll be able to vote and, and control your political destiny. So from its beginning, it had that, um, that energy and that, um, that uh, intentional um, community planning, um, which is sort of all throughout Weeksville. Throughout the 19th century, it was a haven for Black abolitionists, for um, Black freedom fighters, a, a bunch of Black political organizing, not just only around um, abolition and um, anti-slavery stuff, but also around education, healthcare, um, newspapers, uh, even sports stuff. It had its own um, baseball team, just a really vibrant community that um, eventually as Brooklyn began to actually urbanize um, was subsumed into what became Brooklyn and became its sort of own neighborhood. That's how Weeksville and Black people understood Weeksville. White people understood it to be this lawless, awful place. You look in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle and there's all these articles talking about how dirty it is and how everybody there is all awful and terrible. So even then there's sort of like this dual um, understanding of this community. And then the other part of Weeksville's story is its quote unquote rediscovery in 1968 a class, community history class at Pratt um, was doing a just, just general history of Brooklyn class, um, kept coming across the name Weeksville in, in uh, archives, were wondering what that community was. Um, there's various sort of like romantic stories about like they rented a prop plane and they flew over um, the neighborhood and they saw sort of like the old um, uh, road that would have led into Weeksville that was completely off the, the, the grid system that currently exists. They saw remnants of that old road. But long story short, they found sort of three remaining houses that have been standing there, um, you know, since the, er, one since the early 1900s, the other since the 1800s, um, that were the sort of last um, architectural uh, remnants of that community. There were other houses too that were eventually um, uh, on land that was already slated to be made into a housing project. Um, but basically there was a whole community effort uh, and and notably it was a black community effort in Brooklyn um, to preserve this history and to preserve this um, information. And um, the the activists who work on it, it was a multiracial activist group, but um, you know, Weeksville is one of the first places in the country in which um, the National Historic Register um, was registering uh, black history sites specifically. Um, uh, people who worked in there were uh, and doing the history in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, such so forward thinking, 
you know, at the cutting edge of even more forward thinking than I think most museums today, like at the cutting edge of understanding how museums can really work within a community, how museums can quote unquote be diverse, um, all these sort of like buzzwords that we think of as, as life today in 2023, they were already thinking and many, 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 many years ahead of our thinking um, in 1968 where what they were doing. Um, so those are sort of like the two versions, uh, two parts of Weeksville's story. Um, I started working at Weeks Weeksville in uh, 2005. I'd worked at other Black history sites in um, Massachusetts at the at the um, Boston African American National Historic Site, which is a National Park Service site. Um, and I'd worked in museums and was interested in museum studies. Um, so I started working in Weeksville then, um, and I was there until 2011. Um, and when I was there, it was going through another transition period. Its longtime supporter and president, Joan Maynard, who had been with the organization since the 60s, had just um, retired. And we had a new sort of like powerhouse um, CEO, Pam Green, um, who really, uh, I mean, a remarkable person who basically um, with took jo what Joan Maynard had started um, Joe Maynard had really um, just been sort of like a, eventually a one woman crusade to get the city to um, uh, really support the project. So when I was there, they were just starting to build what's now the Resource Center. It's a whole um, uh, green LED building, beautiful building um, that, that was designed over there. They re-landscaped the whole thing. I was there when they were doing all that work, but we were really restarting a lot of the programming that had passed away, one of which was their oral history program. So like I said, in the 60s and 70s, they were extremely forward thinking. So they were doing oral histories even then. Um, they had some tapes that we were sort of um, um, pulling from and, and um, that I spent a lot of time transcribing. Um, and, uh, but we start, restarted the oral history program. Um, at that point, we had sort of like four focuses. One was to talk to people who were involved in that 1968 um, restoration of Weeksville to really get as many, um, as much information as we could on what that process looked like. The other was to interview people who were descended from um, documented Weeksville residents. The third was to talk to long-term um, Brooklyn residents, was basically um, the uh, people who had come in the Great Migration. Um, and the fourth was to document uh, the jazz sites that were in central Brooklyn around Weeksville starting in the 1920s and 30s. Um, central Brooklyn was a, a huge um, uh, jazz, um, jazz club and jazz musician um, locus. So it was documenting that history that began in the 1930s and went through um, into the 1980s. Um, so I worked on the, on the oral history project with Jennifer Scott, who you mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, did a lot of the um, interviews with her. The thing that inspired Liberty was we did an interview with uh, a woman named Ellen Hawley, who's a direct descendant of Sylvana Smith, who founded Weeksville, and his daughter, um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was the first Black female doctor in New York State, and who grew up in Weeksville up until she was 10. Um, and very rare. It's, you know, it's a, uh, Ellen Hawley was an extremely um, wonderful person to interview because their family actually uh, kept meticulous records of everything. They have, um, they're able to trace their family back to the early, late 1600s in this country. Um, they have letters back and forth. You know, their family was literate from a very early and literate and free from a very early part of their family history. So everything is documented. Um, and Ellen Hawley herself, uh, was, a, was an actress. She's a, sort of like a famous um, soap opera actress in the 70s, but before that she was involved in Black Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. Um, and we sat down and did this, Jennifer Scott did this interview with her. I was in the room as well, did a lot of the transcription of that interview. Um, and what was super fascinating to me was, um, you know, I, when we were there, we were more interested, most of, I think most of the people who worked at Weeksville when I was there and, and what drew me to Weeksville was we were really interested in, in, we weren't so much interested in sort of like the stories of Black exceptionalism. Those were sort of like, and, and that trope that um, Black history is solely about when a Black person is first in a white space. Not interested in that at all. 
we're interested in Black history as um, what it means amongst ourselves, around, amongst Black people. And we were not really interested in respectability politics of Black history. We definitely weren't sort of interested in sort of like just um, looking at who was the first in a certain space. So um, I was really pleasantly surprised that Ellen Hawley's um, history of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, really she emphasized sort of like what is the toll of being part of this um, Black exceptional family, the emotional toll, um, because uh, after they left Weeksville, they lived in downtown Brooklyn for a little bit. And then um, Ellen Hawley's uh, generation and the generation just before her um, integrated a suburb in New Jersey. But she was very clear that that integration took a huge emotional toll on her as a child and that she did not consider that white town her home. She considered her home Brooklyn, which they would go back to on the weekends to be amongst Black people. And so um, that was super fascinating to me. And she told the story about uh, the doctor, um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart's daughter, uh, this woman named um, Anna, um, Anna Peaches McKinney, later Anna Hawley, um, who married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti. Um, right before the marriage, she told her mother she didn't want to go through with it. She'd only met her groom once before. Um, and her mother sort of said, you have to go through with it. This would be um, social suicide if you didn't, because they were part of this sort of Black elite uh, middle and upper class that emerged um, right after the Civil War. And uh, and so she went through with the marriage, moved to Haiti, um, lived in this absolutely beautiful family compound um, that her in-laws had set up in Haiti, um, had servants sort of like live this very luxurious life, but her husband was um, emotionally and physically abusive. Uh, after she had her children, her mother came down to take care of her for a little bit saw how she was living and sort of, you know, felt intense um, guilt over forcing her child into this marriage. So helped her essentially escape from Haiti. They had to, the story is that she pinned her um, diaper, her children's diapers to the underside of her skirt so that her husband wouldn't know she was leaving for a long time and pretended to go out to visit a friend and then got into a carriage and, and made it to a ship that was leaving. And then within their family's oral history, they talk about how um, she could see her in-laws sort of like coming after her from like the boat's deck and, and she made it to the U.S. She never went back, um, but through for the rest of her life, she would get letters from her in-laws saying, um, you have brought shame to the Negro race. You are a terrible mother. Um, the breakup of this marriage means the end of, uh, you know, Black respectability. Um, you're an awful person for doing this. And this marriage is not just about these two families. This marriage is about the future of uh, Black people as citizens. And when you broke up this marriage, you're proving to everybody that we are worthless. Um, and so immense social economic pressure to go back, but she never did. Um, so all of that made that story interesting to me. I wasn't so much interested in, uh, you know, being the first black doctor or like what that took or anything. I was more interested in this, um, real psychological and social drama going on, um, between these two families. Yeah. Thank you so much for the very rich response in regards to telling the story of the two Weeksville that exist at the Weeksville Heritage Center, which I think is very important to tell in that split and also talking about the way that you wanted to tell the story, which I really appreciated because um, it didn't have like a vindicationist um, voice behind it. Whereas it's like, you know, we are here too, but it was more like, this is a story that exists and like the richness of it is like um, the, the nuance and the details and, um, in some ways, like the minutia of, well, mostly like to, to me, like the complicated relationship between a mother and, and, and a daughter, but like, is just like a, a really wonderful story by itself. And I, I think my follow-up question to that is, um, you know, we have these two spaces of, um, uh, of free black communities, right? You have Weeksville, which is one free black community and you have Haiti, which is a, Free Black Nation, the first free Black nation to exist, uh, getting its independence in 1804. But, you know, as this work is written in the 1860s, that, you know, Haiti is at a time where it is dealing with the indemnity from 1825 and um, that affects how it's able to operate as a nation 
Um, and, you know, I think it's fascinating that like, um, you know, you go from one space where um, there is a particular freedom um, to another space where um, liberty ends up like in a very submissive space. So, um, you know, in the way that you discuss the, the story um, from the oral history of Ellen Holly, there seems to be like, um, like some very interesting departures. And um, I guess in regards to relationship between the, the mother and the daughter, which is like uh, very complicated, um, how, I guess, how did you decide on the reasonings or using the oral history as a source to tell the story that you wanted to tell? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the oral history was where it started. That's where the idea for the novel came from. And, um, you know, it's when, I think there's some, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian, I'm a fiction writer. So I was really taken um, by first Ellen Holly's presence just alone. You know, she's a trained actress. Um, so she's wonderful at um, at uh, at 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 speech at speaking. You know, she told this beautiful story. And this, she sort of has like that Lena Horne, like old Black Hollywood, like um, speaking diction. So it was just like very um, wonderful. And she's talking about you know like her grandmother telling her what Haiti smelled like, and you know the flowers and sort of this beautiful perfume of being there, and and all these wonderful things. So that sort of like story seduction, which I think can happen um, if you have a specially charismatic oral history subject, um, was the thing that made me really want to um, uh, uh, write it as as fiction because it seemed like such a fascinating story. And then, um, you know, the, the fun thing about fiction is that, um, you know, when you see or, or a certain theme or idea that you want to highlight, it's fiction. So you can really um, make it, make it, to bend the story to your will. So like um, Anna Hawley married in the early 1900s in, in Haiti. Um, to me, I was really, once I sort of zeroed in on this question of freedom as the theme, I was like, well, it makes more sense to set the story during reconstruction when um, Dr. Susan Smith, Smith McKinney was actually a child, was more closer to what Liberty's age was. But for the purposes of the novel and the purposes of things that I wanted to explore, it made sense to sort of set everything a little bit back in time. Um, and once I sort of allowed myself the freedom to do that, then it really opened up the story to um, to be fictionalized. Wow, thank you. Um, and yeah, that's a really good point to make. And um, I guess one of the questions was like, what was it like to use oral history as evidence um, during the process of fiction writing? But like, um, I guess one thing I really appreciated in the story um, is the mention of the, the benevolence society um, or like in, in your work on page 89, it's um, the ladies intelligence society. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my first question is like, um, is that a call back to the Abyssinian Benevolent Daughters of Esther Association? Yeah, there's um, there's that, and then also the in in Weeksville's newspaper Freedom's Torchlight, which we only have one like, existing copy of. There's a reference to something called um, the FIA, the Female Intelligence Agency, which is, of course is like a very evocative name for our, you know in our current um, century, uh, and. Uh, writing about it sort of became like, well, what what would that have been? Where would that sort of have gone? And knowing what we know about, um, you know, benevolent organizations and Black women's organizing, um, what would this sort of have looked like? Um, and it became, you know, if we're talking about like craft-wise in the novel, if the novel's going to take place during Reconstruction, I knew I had to talk about the Civil War, but the Civil War has been written about endlessly in novels. So how do you write about it in a way that's not a cliche? And also this is a, going to be a free Black girl in the North. So the, her entry into the Civil War is going to look very different. Um, and so writing about that group became like a really um, uh, way that served the what's what I wanted to do with the project while also sort of like 
fulfilling the duty of having to explain um, how this character lived through that time in history. Great, thank you. And then um, the other thing I really appreciated about that, and maybe I'll take out the time to read a small excerpt, but I really wanna get into um, the idea of like record keeping and like um, a lot of the things that you do in regards to challenging archival silences. But um, there's, for me, I guess, like as an archivist, I really enjoy this section because it like kind of speaks to the importance of like what is record keeping. There, there is the idea of posterity, but there is like the act of keeping keepsakes from people that you love and want that you want to know are loved, right? Um, and so I'm just gonna read this section. It's um, on the second part of 89, um, but I'll start. So to, to bring them back down when a workday was done, they would turn to some sort of amusement. It had to be something calming, something sober. We need to rest a little in order to keep going was Miss Annie, what Miss Annie always said. They decided on trading compliments. They'd write them down on slips of paper, unsigned but addressed to the lady they wished to compliment, and then put them in old flower tin ma mama hat. At the end of the meeting, they draw the slips out one at a time and read the ode, and then the fun began in guessing the author. Everyone saved their praise by pasting the compliments into little books they stitched together and then passing them around to be signed by every lady present a record of attendance. They made bindings out of the rags that they had around, stuffed into the bottom of their sewing baskets, friendship albums, they called them. Um, everyone's album started neat and clean and pretty, of course, but it was every woman's goal to have a ruined one, a book with worn pages and extra leaves in, one bursting at the seams because that showed how loved you were. Um, so like, uh, one of the things I really love about this work is that, like, um, you know, uh, Weeksville is one of those, like, stories where a history or a past that was almost love, um, lost was, was saved. And, like, um, in this work, I feel like you are, like, continuing it by, like, telling a work of historical fiction, but providing an imagination to it that allows us to um, have this history more fully realized. Um, so I guess, can you speak to like some of the ideas of like record keeping that exists within um, the, the novel itself as like, you know, not only do you have this passage, but like one of the things I appreciate is that there, there are missives being passed between um, Liberty and her mother, um, Kathy, and that like that's a really important way to like understand the relationship. Yeah, well, so the passage you just read is um, based on a real phenomenon. So it's um, mostly found in the life of this woman named Sarah Maps Douglas, who was a black abolitionist in Philadelphia uh, right before the Civil War. And um, in Philadelphia, which also had a, a huge free Black population and was a sort of a hotbed of abolitionist activity, um, there would be these um, uh, groups of, of women would get together. Um, notably, they were interracial groups. Um, and they were organizing for anti-slavery. But what's super interesting is that they, they essentially became like a version of a writing workshop, what we think of today. Um, they would write, at the end of their meetings, they would sort of write um, free write, and then um, they would put all their what they'd written into into like a, a bowl, and then they'd take them out and sort of read whatever they'd written, and then they'd paste them into their friendship um, uh, uh, albums, which are actually in the free public li free library of Philadelphia has all those albums. So that was super fascinating to me that there was sort of that that this was how these women were sort of contemplating and understanding. Um, uh, their own political work sort of in real time. Um, and then also that they chose to document it in that way and sort of those friendship album way, that friendship album way. 
Um, Sarah Mapostolkis actually talks about how she was born free uh, free. So for her, she actually didn't under really understand what abolitionism was until she joined this group and that through those writing exercises, she began to understand why abolitionism was important, why she as a free Black woman should be fighting for the freedom of other Black people, which is also super fascinating to me because we treat that as sort of like Oh, of course people were like that, but of course they weren't. Of course it's it it's a development of a political consciousness. We don't like are not we're not like just born into like understanding that it actually takes um a sort of like a real uh moments or or a series of moments to sort of form that political consciousness and to form that understanding. Um and for that reason I really sort of love that story and wanted to find a way to include it in the novel. Um, and in terms of the writing back and forth between Liberty and her mother, um, you know, these are characters who are emotionally repressed. They never sort of say anything directly to each other. So there had to be a way for these two, and the, and the novel is all told from Liberty's perspective, the eye for her never breaks. So there had to be a way for the reader to sort of understand um, what was happening between these two characters while also allowing um, Liberty's perspective to be um, throughout the novel. And of course, Liberty, um, what was really fun about writing from her perspective is that she gets many, she reads many things wrong. She's sort of like incorrect, incorrect conclusions for much of the novel of what she's seeing and hearing and interacting with, especially around her mother. And so um, one of the ways to clue in the reader that this is perhaps an unreliable narrator is, is those letters back and forth um, which you can sort of see um, Liberty's mother's emotional longing for her and Liberty's just sort of like rebuff or, or misunderstanding of what her mother is actually saying. Yeah, I mean, um, there are moments in the novel where I write down like, you know, the reaction that Liberty is providing is definitely that of like, um, a young teenager where she's just like, I'm being sent away. And I was just like, no, your mom wants you to get an education. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a helpful way to understanding like reconsidering like what is truth and like that, you know, it is subjective, like, which is something that is understood when you're doing oral history work that like mm -hmm. the truth that you're receiving is from this person's point of view. Um, and I guess, the next phase that I wanted to move to was like, um, you know, um, one thing I really like is that, you know, you are clearly like very well versed in the history of, of Wheatsville and like, you know, working there for as long as you were able to. And then like the attention to detail in regards to like, one, the migration that exists in like the 19th century for like black folks in regards to going to Haiti and then like um you know then just being in Haiti itself so like what was it like kind of like um you know working with an oral history source and like the evidence that you had around Weeksville to like trying to then tell the story um in tell the story in Haiti like um from a space that like you may have had like different sources to to use. Yeah, so um, the Haiti portion of the story was also what sort of excited me. And, um, you know, the way that we, and I'm sure that this is your method, everybody's methodology as well, but um, one of the things that I was doing um, with Jennifer is we would do the oral histories uh, and then I would sort of be writing the, um, the sort of like accompanying summary document which meant that I was going back and sort of like finding um, source material to either um, complement or or supplement whatever was in the oral history. So if somebody mentioned a place or whatever, it was going back into the archives and finding that place, finding whatever we could of that place saying, oh, it's also mentioned in this article in the New York Age, or it's also mentioned by this person or whatever. So um, when she was mentioning Haiti, talking about Haiti, um, you know, it, it, I was doing reading more and more and you sort of see how much that black um, uh, middle and upper class that would later become the group of people who became sort of Du Bois's talented 10th, how much those people were really understood their role in sort of an international focus and how much those people were corresponding with Haiti. Um, you know, Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, her, her, her first husband, um, I think his name was William McKinney, 
was a physician and um, worked at a HBCU um, and, or, you know, just a, an H, I guess, like a BCU then, but um, uh, he, he in the 1800s and he was traveling back and forth to Haiti himself. He was traveling back and forth to see this archbishop who their family ended up intermarrying with. Um, that archbishop, it was an American, you know, um, there's a whole, uh, as I was doing more research, there's a whole colony of Black Americans who moved to Haiti both before the Civil War because Haiti was actively recruiting Black people to come, knowing that that would be a threat to the U.S. and the U.S. would freak out about that. Um, so it was a little, sort of like a, a, um, a little bit of um, a adversary, you know, um, hostile di diplomacy going on. But also, I think they actually genuinely did want um, Black Americans to come. Um, and then after the Civil War, there were um, Black people going there to work as missionaries um, and really with a very sort of like um, colonial mindset towards Haiti, which is very fascinating. It's um, Black people in the 1880s and 1890s going there and writing back to um, Black church newspapers, which actually sort of uh, the, the newspaper of um, the African Methodist Episcopal Church um, sort of uh, doubled as a as a nationwide Black newspaper because there were so many AME churches and they were all getting this bulletin. So when you read there, there's these letters in there from um, Black missionary, Black American missionaries in Haiti talking about how terrible the country is, how they need um, you know, Christians, because they're worried that the country is Catholic, they're like, they need Christians, by which they mean they need Protestants to move down there to make sure that they don't go into the sort of like the papal way. Um, they're talking about, very interestingly, they're talking about how women in Haiti are too, have too much power, um, and that uh, they really need to follow sort of like, you know, they're the, all these people are deeply into respectability politics, so they don't want women to work outside of the home. They're like too many Haitian women work outside of the home. They 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 run the marketplaces. They run the whole economy. They run the market economy. That's why Haiti can't succeed. Men need to be running that, and women need to be solely in the home. And that's what we're going there to, to teach them, quote unquote. So. That's a whole mess of worms to like sort of get into, and and it and it challenges a lot of our assumptions about how people fought in the past, or and and about um, transracial solidarity and sort of all these things that sort of um, we romanticize about how people might have been, um, and that of course is is super interesting for me as a writer. You know, um, I what I didn't want to fall into is many um, historical novels, especially historical novels where women are the main characters, you know, fall into a lot of tropes where it's like this plucky lady is saying no and she's like putting her foot down and she's really, you know, feisty. Like I did not want that to be the arc and story of this. Um, uh, and like those sorts of novels where, you know, essentially the hero or heroine is, has our sensibilities and is just like back in time and somehow like they have the right opinion on everything um, and they're not problematic at all. Like I did not want to do that at all. So once I, I read that, I was like, well, here's my way in to be really um, uh, true to human nature, which is not, you know, politically correct in, in any sort of way. So, um, so yeah, those were sort of the ways that I, but, but Researching for Haiti was very, at first, very difficult, and or, or at least was intimidating because I don't speak Creole. Um, the period of history that I was interested in, which you know is the 1880s, um, there's very little, or was when I start first started researching, very little published in English about it. Most of the stuff is either about the Haitian Revolution or about 20th century Haiti. And this sort of like snippet of 20 years, it was actually really difficult to find. Um, good stuff around. Um, but luckily, you know, novels take, a, historical novels take a very long time to write. By the time I was sort of in the middle of it, more people had published stuff in English about it. Um, and I also felt more comfortable um, sort of imagining the things that I couldn't um, find in the archives. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for, thank you for that. And um, we are at 7.15, so uh, I do have another question, but I am going to say that if you have any if you have any questions, please like add it to the chat, and um, from there I'll like read it out for for Caitlin. And um, like I guess in the meantime, I think uh, a, an important thing to like discuss is uh, maybe like the theme of the theme of colorism that exists throughout the novel, and um, I think one thing I found fascinating was like the difference between um, between liberty and her mother, and 
also one thing I was doing in preparation for um, this talk was like, I mean, listening to a podcast by Leslie M. Alexander talking about Black internationalism in Haiti, but like one of the things that she was talking about was like um, folks who could pass still staying within their communities and like wondering or thinking or like wanting to work with those accounts, which um, I think is like a, a very interesting idea. But, um, you know, with that migration and transition from like one space where colorism and um, passing um, means one thing, and then like when you go to Haiti, it means a completely other thing. Was that um, something that, I mean, what ways did you try to uh, deal with that in, in writing the, the novel? Yeah, I mean, I tried to do as, do as much research as I could around both like the sociology of colorism. So there's um, a lot of really great stuff around it. And then I tried to read as, as many um, uh, diaries and um, just personal recollections as I could, mostly by um, people who could pass, mostly by lighter skinned people. Um, and to sort of see what language they would have used to describe that phenomenon. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of the the terminology has been so corrupted in the last two or three years by like pop culture and by um, social media where people are calling people white passing who like are not and like using that as like a slur or whatever. Like it's it's gone to a crazy place where um, I was sort of more interested in talking about um, how people actually lived that in the past, which is um, much more complicated, I think, than than we think about it, than some of us think about it today. Um, so like one, a really huge, wonderful source was um, uh, uh, Alice Dunbar Nelson, who was a, a Black woman writer and poet um, uh, starting in like the early 1900s. And then she was part of the Harlem Renaissance too, sort of, she was old, a little bit older than um, most people in the Harlem Renaissance, but she was part of that movement as well. Um, and she wrote really candidly about um, being white passing. I mean, I look at pictures of her and I'm like, white passing to who? Like, this is not, <laughs> but but that's the thing about, about passing and about colorism is like, it's it's extremely subjective. The sociologists who study it, one of the, the sort of like guiding um, uh, takeaway from their work that I took was when they, when you, when you put a person it's it's all dependent on context. So one person can be considered um, dark skinned in one community, and you take that same person, and you put them somewhere else, and they are considered light skinned. And that is um, uh, across uh, a sort of like racial types. It's not like white people assuming that someone is light skinned when they're not. It's both um, black and non black people um, misreading, if we want to call it that that person's skin color. So it's all dependent on context. Someone who is dark skinned in one place is considered light skinned somewhere else and vice versa. And so um, Alice Dunbar Nelson talks very candidly about um, being light skinned, feeling like everybody dark skinned hates her. I mean, that's like a big part of that internal narrative. She's kind of like, they all hate me, but then she also talks about how much she hates all the dark skinned women she's working with. And she's actually like actively working against them. Super fascinating. Um, but this is all in her diary. She 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 wrote a uh, poem about being light skinned. I think called like brass tacks or something that she's that's in her diaries. And she's like, I can never publish this. It's like too controversial or whatever because it's all about like the pain, you know. Um, but in public, she was extremely pro black. She would never. She you know she was involved in sort of like all these black things. She was she ran um, schools for black children in multiple places. You know, she's like she's working within these things. But then in the diary, she's talking about like. I really wanted to have a good seat at the opera. So I just bought a ticket at the white thing and I went through and like this, there's like conditional passing that she has no guilt about whatsoever. So that really like thorny, complex, interesting, um, again, doesn't subscribe to sort of any current idea or morality that we have around those sorts of things were the accounts that I was looking for when I was um, trying to research and figure out the, the voice around um, that stuff. Oh my God, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And um, I, I will go to there, like our multiple questions now. And um, I will go with the first one, which is um, from Oma Columbia. Can you talk a little more about your career trajectory and the place of your work at historical sites in it? Um, from your writer's bio, we never know you worked at Weeksville. How and why did you end up in these jobs slash roles? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, professional bios are conditional. <laughs> we rewrite them for certain spaces. Um, I worked in in museums and historic sites starting at 14 years old. I worked in our um, state capital, like giving tours and stuff. And then um, I, I had an older sister who's now a historian who started at um, as a seasonal park ranger at uh, Boston African American National Historic Site. I took that job as well and um, just always super interested in, in history and, and place and public history as well. Um, you know, to me, um, the reason why we study history and write about it is to make it accessible to other people. I don't really, um, which, which is why I did not become an academic. Um, you know, I, and even when I was thinking about becoming an academic, it was always sort of like, well, I'll do all this research and then write a novel about it sort of on the side, you know? And then once I realized that wasn't really sustainable in academia, it was sort of like, well, let me just be a fiction writer who um, uses the archives a lot. Um, so I, uh, and so, so the two things have always been a part of my life, history, um, doing archival work and doing creative writing. Um, and, uh, you know, when I made the decision to do, um, uh, creative writing stuff, I, I was in an MFA program while I was working at, um, Weeksville. So I, I did my MFA classes at night and worked at Weeksville during the day. Um, and, uh, sort of the two would converge and, and come back together over time. Great, thank you. And then um, I'm gonna read the next question from Sash. Um, could you tell us about securing consent with the narrator, Ms. Holly, in creating fiction that's inspired by an oral history interview with her? Sure, so um, Ellen Holly, uh, when I, the novel is, is, is as much removed from her family's family history that like it's not it's not her directly at all um and I tried to make very clear like which parts were inspired by her family's story and which was not um part of it also is that she she had already written all of this information down in a published autobiography so it's not like this is giving information that has not already existed to the public um she was 87 when we did that oral history and and that was uh, uh 10 years ago so she's I'm, I'm assuming no longer alive it's been very difficult to track down where she is she has not answered any um letters and um she did not have any children of her own and uh she did belong to uh she was a delta but the deltas do not give out personal information unless you are a delta so actually tracking her down when the book was publishing was next to impossible. Um, but because she had already written that autobiography, which is extremely detailed, um, even more detailed than the oral history that she gave to us, um, it's, you know, it's already in the public eye, public information um, that she's released herself in her own um, part of it. Mm, okay. Um, the next question is from La, La Crescia Neal and um, it says, uh, I'm a writer and a Black woman. Can you speak to the process of getting published? Sure. Um, so publishing a novel, um, usually uh, if you are writing a first novel, you are writing the full draft first on your own and then bringing it to an agent to then bring to publishers. And it's a very long process publishing a novel. Um, I mean, hopefully you want it to be a long process because you want to have the chance to edit and read and reread and make sure what you're sending out into the world is actually what you want it to be. Um, and uh, so you, you hopefully what you're doing is you're looking at um, writers whose career track, who are currently alive, whose career track you admire and whose work you um, interests you and you think is exciting or, or is you think is what fiction can be. Then you're looking up who those people's agents are and then you're writing to those agents and saying, um, I like your client's work because of this very specific reason. And this is why my work is in conversation with that or like that or, or maybe of interest to you and, and um, would you like to read it? And then hopefully they answer that query letter and say yes. And then you're sending your thing off. Then the agent is working with you for either a few weeks or months or sometimes years on your manuscript before sending it off to um, submitting it to editors who then, um, you know, hopefully there, there's an auction on your book. That means many people want it. But even if there isn't, even if it's just one person who wants it, that's wonderful as well. And um, then you're on your road to uh, publishing. But 
it it is something that takes a very long time. And um, I know people get frustrated with that, but I actually think that's to um, books advantage. You know, hopefully you're taking that time to really think through what your artistic project is and um, what, what you're particularly saying here. Um, and sort of the idea that you're going to be like writing a book a year or like it's all going to come really fast. Um, those ideas of productivity and um, content producing does not uh, appeal, uh, subscribe to the novel. And I think that's actually a good thing. Hmm. Thank you. And then um, the, the next question that we have is from... Uh, Catherine Nastrom, which is uh, the theme of freedom is so clear in the novel. But when I was reading the early pages, I noticed how much care was a focus. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the relationship of care and freedom. Yeah, so um, that's one of the questions of the novel is sort of like when we're talking about freedom, what do we owe to other people? Um, uh, you know, there's sort of like the current uh, American mainstream understanding of freedom is sort of like, I can do whatever I want to whoever I want, whenever my freedom is measured by how much I can get away with doing to someone who has less power than me, mm. uh, whether that's a child or the land or um, my neighbor or, or anything like that, like that's how I'm measuring my freedom. But if we're talking about being in community with people, if we're talking about, um, uh, being uh, uh, coming from a, a background or um, family lineage or genealogy or community that has um, experienced trauma, then like how do we uh, maintain our own personal understanding of liberty and freedom while maintaining ties with a community that needs care um, and that runs on care? Um, so when I was working on this novel, I was at Radcliffe Institute and um, one of the other fellows who was there was um, the visual artist um, Jatavia Gary, and um, she has a pretty famous piece that's a um, Sadia Hartman quote that says, care is the antidote to violence. And it's sort of like, it, it's in, it's written in neon and it's like surrounded by a neon heart. A lot of people have like um, reproduced that piece. But she, she had just done that piece when we met. Um, and so uh, I was really struck by it, like many, many people have been, and, um, and struck by that quote. And um, thinking of that within sort of like this larger question of freedom, a freedom that exists outside of sort of violence or domination. Um, and so what would that look like? Yeah, thanks. And I'm, I'm gonna try to squeeze in this last question because I think it's important. Um, so it's from Amber um, and it says, thank you so much. Some of us are working full-time while pursuing Omar part-time. What systems of care do you utilize to take care of yourself and those who rely on you? Uh, in work like yours that is full of love and labor, how do you ensure that the process and the work remains generative for you? Um, I mean, that's like an ongoing question that has a different answer for every project. And I like, I think for me right now, I'm focusing on what I was talking about a little bit earlier about like divorce, divorcing the idea of the work that I do as um, connected to efficiency or connected to um, sort of like this current cultural um, calendar that we have that asks of artists and academics and people to be constantly creating content for like this larger machine that's just using that for nefarious ends. So what I, what we need to re, I think a lot of us need to sort of rethink, like we don't actually need to be publishing every six months or every year, whatever target that you've set for yourself. Um, you know, it, the books don't have to come that, that quickly. It's actually comes from really um, taking our time and sort of slowing ourselves down. I was like, lifting weights earlier today with my trainer and she was like you're being way too you're being too efficient with lifting the weight she was like you're supposed to feel the gain in your muscle like you're supposed to actually be going really slowly you're not supposed mm -hmm. to be efficient when you're lifting weight um and uh i think that's sort of really true for the for all the work that we're doing if you're doing that sort of like really heavy work it's not supposed to be efficient it's not supposed to be fast it's not supposed to be easily consumable it's not supposed to be understood on a first reading um and so uh that means that you have to slow down and creating it which means um you're going to be taking some more time you know thank you so much for 
that response. Um, and I think, you know, this is the end of our engagement. And I just want to thank you so much for being in conversation with me. I hope that everyone um, was able to learn so much as I was. And um, at this point, I'm just going to um, pass it back off to Amy. Yeah, thank you so much, Obden. And thank you, Caitlin. I also learned so much and found this to be a really uh, like sustaining conversation. I, 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 I thank you. Um, I'm grateful for that. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, we'll send out, we have a little list going of our favorite oral history novels. We'll send it out to everyone who's attended these events to kind of keep the conversation going. Um, and we'll be reporting back about what we what we think we're learning about oral history by thinking in this big space of oral history and the novel. Um, so stay tuned. Our students are creating a bunch of interactive oral history experiences around their work in late April and early May. And we're gonna have some in-person workshops that'll be announced shortly um, that are gonna be in the third week in April. So there'll be more chances to engage and, and continue the conversation. Um, but thank you all so much for, for being here and for the really, really excellent questions. Um, if any of the students who facilitated wanna stick around for a minute to debrief your welcome to, but not obligated to. And also I highly recommend anyone who hasn't to visit Weeksville and also to read uh, Caitlin's Charlie Freeman book because it's so, it's really different and it's so good. So um, if you're not, I, I imagine you're all already inspired to follow her, but follow this woman through her whole career, please. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.